for those joining us. Good morning. Today we're going to be jumping in on into a discussion, uh, switching gears and getting into convection. Hopefully getting through the majority of lecture 15 so that you can complete your homework assignment without too much difficulty and that everything will be kind of straightforward and you'll be comfortable with some of the concepts that we need before we jump into heat exchangers next week. So let's get into our discussion on convection and convective heat transfer. Now last week we had defined convection as heat transfer, which occurs due to fluid motion or fluid flow, where we had defined convection via Newton's law of cooling as H times the surface area times our temperature gradient, delta T, where H is our heat transfer coefficient, and delta T is some um, surface temperature minus some ambient, ambient or surrounding temperature. We can also consider it convection as an enhancement of heat transfer over conduction. due to fluid flow. And to quantify this enhancement, we can look at a comparison between convection and conduction. such that if I was gonna derive an expression that looked at convection over conduction, I would find comparing my Newton's law of cooling with Fourier's law, that I could cancel some terms within this comparison. And so if I'm looking over at the same surface, considering the same gradient, what I find is the enhancement of heat transfer due to convection can be described as this ratio, H times delta X over K, more better given as H times some characteristic length over K, which can be characterized as a dimensionless value known as a new salt number. And so from this, we can define a new salt number and sub u as a ratio of convective heat transfer. to conductive heat transfer. And we can also state that the Nusselt number represents the enhanced heat transfer that we see, or the enhancement of heat transfer due to fluid flow. Which really means what we're, we're getting at is that for when we describe this dimensionless value Nusselt number, 
we can we can define it as essentially how much better do we have in terms of heat transfer or how improved is our heat transfer due to the fact that the fluid is moving. So it's a comparison between what we would consider conduction within a fluid if the fluid had no flow occurring, which we can consider when we are looking at that uh, window problem with the two panes, the air in that sense is you know, has a small enough gap that there's no flow. So that's considered, you know, that's just conduction through that, that air. And that's a comparison between that kind of situation where if we allowed that fluid to flow, what would be the increase or enhancement in that heat transfer that would arise due to that flow? And we define that through a Neusselt number, which means if my Neusselt number was simply one, that would imply only conduction is occurring and that there is no enhancement. However, in, in that sense, that's almost never the case because even in instances where you have no, you know, force flow, you can still have the emergence of natural convection where those temperature gradients induces flow within a fluid. So there's any questions here and I can zoom out to help you guys kind of get your notes in. Any questions on what I've kind of identified and illustrated so far? When we're looking at convection, we can compare it to conduction to get an idea in terms of the improvement in heat transfer that we see due to the fluid motion, which we can, can quantify through a dimensionless value known as the Neusselt number. All right, I'm gonna judge by your silence that you're kind of all on the same page with me and everything's good. So in addition to Neusselt number, a few things that we also have to consider associated with convection is the boundary layers, or more specifically, the thermal boundary layers that emerge and convective flow. And we can think and quantify it this way. If I have a system like this, and I have flow occurring through this system, and let's say I have heat transfer into that fluid. This has some, you know, temperature T naught, this has some temperature T1, and we'll say there's a net heat flux into the fluid as it flows through this pipe. Now, just like we have the emergence of, you know, flow and viscous boundary layers that exist near the surface, those boundary layers also induce a thermal boundary layer as well. Now they're not gonna align exactly, but they will be similar. And what that means is that in addition to these viscous forces influencing what we can experience with shear, as this heat transfer occurs, these boundary layers essentially will influence what we can expect in terms of a thermal heat transfer because we're not going to have perfect mixing. If this was perfect mixing, this temperature gradient would be uniform such that any heat that gets transferred to the fluid would immediately get dispersed amongst the entire fluid. But instead, we, we get a localization of temperatures at the surface, which means you may have some, you know, measured temperature gradient that occurs throughout this flow path, but that will be varying as compared to the actual gradient that occurs at the interface between the fluid and whatever solid it's in contact with. 
And so that boundary layer or that thermal boundary layer is going to influence what we can expect in terms of the actual convection that occurs within the system. And so simply put is the emergence of a thermal boundary layer during convective heat transfer or during convection will influence the effective temperature gradient and heat transfer rate into or out of the a fluid. And so we can quantify this boundary layer emergence and influence through the use of a second dimensionless value, which is known as the Prandtl number. And the Prandtl number is a comparison of the molecular diffusivity of momentum over the molecular diffusivity of heat or heat transfer, which we can characterize as the kinematic viscosity of a fluid over its thermal diffusivity, or in more simpler values, the viscosity of the fluid times the heat capacity over the thermal conductivity. And since viscosity, heat capacity, and thermal conductivity are intrinsic properties, that also tells us that the Prandtl number is also an intrinsic property. Is there any questions on my discussion of thermal boundary layers and how it gives rise to the necessity for a Prandtl number? All right. So then let me guys ask you a question. So do you think, or will a high or low Prandtl number enhance convection? What do you think? For this, we can play rock, paper, scissors. We haven't done that in a while. So if you think a high number will enhance convection, you can go rock. If you think a low, you can go paper. And if you think it doesn't matter, or you're unsure, or it depends, you can say scissors. All right. So I'll give you guys a second to come up with your answers. All right, so let's see. You guys ready? Paper, scissor, rock, shoot. All right, I see a scissors, one scissors. I see some rocks, some reluctant rocks, some sad rocks. All right, chat's blowing up. Everybody's hitting those DMs. Scissors, scissors, paper, rock, paper, paper. Lots of papers, lots of rock. 
it's a, I don't know, it's a good mix. Good mix. I like it. The answer in this case is rock. In general, we want high Prandtl numbers. That will relate and result in improved convection, which we'll see here in a second. So before we jump into all the equations, one thing I want to state, because it's important as it relates to how we can interpret convection, I'm going to put a big star around this. So in general, for convective heat transfer, we often rely on both Reynolds number and Prandtl number to determine a Neusselt number. Then, using Neusselt number, we can calculate a heat transfer coefficient. With the heat transfer coefficient, with H, we can identify our heat transfer rate. And I know that was really long winded. So, you know, in terms of playbook, typically what it is is you calculate Reynolds and, and find and look up Randolph. Yeah, sometimes we can calculate it. Then you can calculate new salt, calculate H and then you can calculate Q. And most often than not, calculating Neusel and heat transfer coefficient can, can get a little lengthy, which is why I alluded last week that a lot of some of these problems, we end up spending a majority of the effort in trying to determine that effective H for our convection system. And keeping in mind, right, our new salt being that heat transfer coefficient times the characteristic length, which is equal to K. And so, you know, definitely want to make sure you have this stored away somewhere because it's extremely important and useful to kind of keep in the, your back pocket in terms of key equations. So let's take a break in all this talk and note taking and look at an example. So in this example, we're cooling oranges and air. And if the effective heat transfer coefficient for this convection system can be expressed as H is equal to 5.05 .05 times K air times Reynolds number to the one third divided by diameter, where in this case, diameter is the characteristic length. If the oranges are being cooled by refrigerated air at five degrees, flowing at a velocity of 0.3 meters per second, what is the convective heat transfer rate from a seven centimeter orange? If it was initially at 15 degrees Celsius and the thermal conductivity of an orange, why they measured it, I'm not sure, but it's 0.5 watts per meter Kelvin. And based on this information, what can we say about the value of our new salt number? All right, so let's take a look at this problem. So 
this example, we are cooling oranges. So in this case, here I'll draw it for you. As I always say, it's important to draw problems. So orange, lots of vitamin C. We know that H is given by this expression, 5.05 .05 times Reynolds to the one third times K divided by the diameter. The diameter of the orange, 0.7 meters, T initial, 15 degrees C, T infinity, five degrees C. The velocity of the air is 0.3 meters per second. And the thermal conductivity of the orange is 0.5 watts per meter Kelvin. So for this, the first thing we should probably identify is the Reynolds number, which we can calculate as rho u d over mu or u d over kinematic viscosity. I have the kinematic viscosity. It's approximately 1.4 times 10 to the minus fifth kilograms per meter second. So for this problem, my Reynolds number, and I'll move it over here for organization purposes, is the velocity of the air, 0.3 meters per second. The diameter of the orange, point. Oh, 07 and the kinematic viscosity of the air 1.4 times 10 to the minus fifth. Oh, it's kinematic viscosity, not regular viscosity. So those units are wrong. Meter squared per second. So if I do this calculation, I should get a Reynolds number of about 1500. With that in mind, I can solve for my H by plugging in terms 5.05 .05 times 1500 to the one third times 0.5 watts per meter Kelvin divided by the diameter or 0 0.07 meters. In this calculation, which my notes are wrong, so give me a second to do the calculation. I got about 413 watts per meter squared Kelvin. Now with that in hand, I can solve for my heat transfer rate, Q convection, using Newton's law of cooling, H times A sub S times T S minus T infinity, which equals 413 watts per meter squared Kelvin. The surface area of a sphere, assuming the orange isn't really weird or misshapen, would be pi times the diameter, or 0 0.07 meters squared, times the temperature gradient 15 minus 10, 5 or 10 degrees Celsius. I do this calculation, I should find that Q convection is equal to approximately 63.5 watts. So that's the heat transfer rate. To find our new salt number, we can use our definition that we have for new salt, which in this case, we're gonna be looking at H times the diameter over K, which here I'm gonna scroll down just a little bit, keep this neat and organized. 
or 413 watts per meter squared Kelvin times the diameter of 0.07 meters divided by K as 0.5 watts per meter Kelvin. And we get a new salt value of approximately 57.8. Any questions on that example? In terms of calculating the Reynolds, using our H expression to find our heat transfer coefficient, then applying Newton's law of cooling, and our new salt definition to find our heat transfer rate, as well as our new salt number. All right, so let's keep rolling. Next thing I wanna talk about is our focus as it comes to convection. You know, when it comes to what we really look at, we specialize in a category known as internal forced convection. Primarily because forced convection, you get better H's and neutral values and it's more efficient. We're engineers when we want to be efficient. And when it comes to process systems, more often than not, you're going to encounter flow that is considered confined and internal, the, you know, pipes, networks, those kinds of things, as well as heat exchangers is, is largely considered uh, applicable in concepts associated with internal force convection. And so it's for that reason that we really take a close look at this case of convection. And when it comes to internal forced convection, there are two cases, so to speak, that are of interest to us in this class. The first was is in the case of a constant surface heat flux. And these are in instances, if I have flow through a pipe, and that fluid is experiencing heat transfer due to temperature gradient that it sees between the fluid as well as the, the pipe and that outside of the pipe, we find that we can quantify that assuming that the flux that experiences on that outside is going to be a constant value. And in this case, what we're most often interested in is a comparison between some in input or entering temperature and an output or exit temperature, which I'll designate T sub I for in and T sub E for exit. So given an input or entering temperature, we can solve for the exit temperature. And if you want, I can do that. Input, exit. And it's essentially the input or entering temperature plus the heat flux times the surface area divided by MCP or M dot, excuse me. And if you if you think about this, I would I would say you, most of you, if not all of you, would probably be able to derive this. But we take a close look at this expression, right? Q times Q dot times A sub S equals M times CP. This is really just a rearrangement of thermodynamic principles. Q is equal to M CP delta T, where delta T is simply a comparison between the exit temperature and the inlet input temperature, right? And Q is simply just Q times A sub S. And so one of the things that I, I do wanna stress for you guys is when we're looking at a lot of these heat transfer principles, especially when it comes to convection, don't neglect your thermal principles because more often than not, in addition to all the 
you know, principles and equations that we use to solve convection problems and particularly heat exchanger problems, it's important to keep in mind that at the end of the day, it's a fluid that has some form of heat capacity and that heat capacity is gonna largely influence what we can expect to see in those temperatures. And so we have this case one for a constant heat flux. And the second case that we look at, which I would argue is more common, is in the case of what's known as a constant surface temperature. And so this is, you know, once again, looking at throw through a pipe, coming in at some input, looking at an exit temperature. But in this case, what we see here is that the surface temperature is constant. And what makes this tricky is even though the surface temperature is constant, the gradient or the t delta T between T sub S and T sub I as compared to T sub S and T sub E is going to be different. And so the temperature gradient is going to change all throughout this pipe. And so we have to consider, well, how can we apply that gradient difference as it relates to our heat transfer? And there's a couple ways that we do this. The first thing, if we're interested in solving for that exit temperature, we can say, well, it's the surface temperature minus the difference between the surface and the input temperature times this value or exponential of negative H A sub S over MCP. Or if I was interested in the convection heat transfer associated with this, I could say it's H sub S sub S, but instead of delta T, I'm more interested in saying, well, what's the most effective way I can describe this temperature gradient? And the best way to do that is through what's at known as a, log, a logarithmic mean temperature gradient, or more aptly named a delta T log mean where I can calculate delta T log mean as simply a comparison between T sub S and T sub I minus T sub S minus T sub E divided by the natural log of T sub S minus T I and T sub S minus T sub E. And I'm sure the seniors have already got this stuff beaten into them but definitely some key equations here. And sometimes you'll see delta T log mean written out as delta T1 minus delta T2 divided by the log mean of delta T1 over delta T2. And so, like I said, when we're looking at internal force convection, you know, and if, if you want, we can call this heat transfer during flow through pipes. We have two cases that we often consider, constant surface heat flux, as well as a constant surface temperature. Right, because when, when it comes to heating fluids that are confined in pipes and pipe systems, we either have some form of surface element heating where that essentially fluid pipe that it's in contact with has some form of electrical input that is constantly putting in a certain amount of energy as it flows. And for you know all intents and purposes, that energy doesn't change even as the temperature is increasing. Or in the more common case, when you have the use of heat exchange networks, you end up with you know, this type of system with a constant surface temperature, depending on the fluid and the temperature rise that we see. So any questions, points of clarification that I can make? If not, 
let's take a look at another example. So for this one, I can say water is entering a two and a half centimeter copper tube of a heat exchanger at 15 degrees C with a rate of 0.3 kilograms per second. And it's to be heated by steam condensing on the outside of the tube to provide a constant surface temperature of about 120 degrees. If the average heat transfer coefficient is about 108, excuse me, 800 watts per meter squared Kelvin, what is the length of the tube necessary to heat the water up to 115 degrees Celsius? All right, so let's take a look at this example. Heating water. With steam. So for this problem, we know that the mass flow rate of the water coming in is approximately 0.3 kilograms per second. The initial temperature was 15 degrees. The final exiting temperature we want is 115 degrees. The temperature, the surface temperature we're using is the steam, which has a constant surface temperature of 120 degrees because it's condensing on the outside of the tubes. The heat transfer coefficient during this heat transfer is 800 watts per meter squared Kelvin. And the tube diameter is, what does I say, 2.5 centimeters or 0.025 meters. So for this problem, we need two key concepts or equations. One from our understanding of thermo, we can identify the necessary heat transfer rate given by MCP delta T, or our mass flow rate of 0.3 kilograms per second times our heat capacity of water, 4,184 joules per kilogram Kelvin, and our desired temperature rise of 100 degrees Celsius. If we do this calculation, we find that we would like to input 125.5 kilowatts into this fluid. Let me just double check that calculation. Yes, so as always, heating water takes a lot of energy. We Are we assuming know. that it's uh, water leaving the pipe as well? Yes. Okay. If, if we, you, you want, we can, can consider the phase change, but that would definitely influence a lot of this problem. So for the, for the purposes of this example, I'm gonna assume the pressure is such that we're, we, we're not reaching that boiling point. But fair question. And so since we're looking at case two, our constant surface temperature, I can also state that my heat flux can be approximated as H sub A sub S times delta T log mean. So what I need to do if I'm interested in finding the length, I'm really looking for my surface area, which rearranging the expression gives me H times delta T log mean. And so I read I need, or what's missing, is my log mean temperature gradient. So I can calculate that based off of my input, exiting, and surface temperature as 120 degrees minus 15 degrees minus 120 degrees minus 115 degrees over the natural log of these two gradients. 120 minus 115. If I complete that calculation, I should get a value of approximately 32.8 degrees Celsius. So now I have delta D log mean, 
I have my heat transfer coefficient and my heat transfer rate. With this, I can solve for my necessary or required surface area, which given my heat transfer rate is 125.5 kilowatts or 125,000 watts. My heat transfer coefficient is provided as 800 watts per meter squared Kelvin, and my delta T log mean is 32.8 degrees Celsius. I get a, a necessary or required surface area of 4.78 square meters. So to find the necessary length of this copper tube, knowing that my surface area can be characterized as pi times d times L, to solve for L, I just need to take the surface area divided by pi times d, or 4.78 square meters divided by pi times 0.025 meters, which if I do that, I should find the required length of this copper tube should be about 61 meters long. So quite a bit of length is necessary to heat up that water. All right. Any questions on that example? I can zoom out so you guys can take a good look at it. Why? Why did you not use the temperature exit equation? Like T E equals. I could, but you would find if you plugged in everything that way, yeah, that would probably give you the same value. I just figured this way was a little more straightforward. All right, any other questions? All right. All right, so the next thing and the last thing we'll probably have time to talk about is identifying new salt numbers in convection flow or for convection. So the first thing you have to consider is, is the flow laminar or turbulent. And so we find that out by calculating our Reynolds number. So step one in a lot of these types of situations is to calculate a Reynolds number. The second thing we have to consider is our entrance effects significant. And the question then becomes, what the heck do I mean about entrance effects? Well, if we can, you can recall from our discussions on fluid mechanics, I said as fluid enters a pipe, we have an entrance region as the flow develops. And as the flow develops in a system, so does the heat transfer gradients. And so we can quantify this primarily for looking at laminar as it's more important in laminar flow than in turbulent flow as the entrance effect. So we compare it for fluid mechanics, which was given as 0.05 times the Reynolds number times the diameter. But for when it comes to heat transfer, the entrance region is much larger as it's governed by once again, that Prandtl number. And so we have to consider 
if the flow is laminar, our entrance region can be calculated as 0.05 times the Reynolds number times the Prandtl number times the diameter. And if we're looking at turbulent flow, the entrance region is simply 10 times the diameter. Now, if I'm gonna be honest, like 99% of the time, if it's turbulent flow, and as long as you like have a pipe of appreciable length, you can, you can pretty much say that there's gonna be no significant entrance effects in turbulent flow. The issue typically comes when you have laminar flow. And so if, if you calculate this length, and L sub H over L, I would say is greater than probably 20%, you're gonna to have to consider the influence of that entrance region in your heat transfer calculations. And so what we find is if your entrance effects are significant, there exists special cases for calculating your Nusselt number. And, and this is, like I said, once again, more so for laminar flow, definitely, than for turbulent flow. But for laminar flow, if we're looking at a circular pipe or flow through a circular pipe, which hopefully nine times out of 10 you're doing. If not, what the heck did you do to the pipe? We can calculate our new salt number as 3.66 plus 0 0.065 times our diameter over our length times our Reynolds number times our Prandtl number divided by 1 plus 0 0.04 times our diameter over our length times Reynolds times Prandtl to the 2 thirds. And if we have flow through parallel plates, because that's a thing. So I gotta be honest, I don't know how you have flow if the plates aren't parallel. That's just me. We have our new salt number given as 7.54 plus 0 0.03 times the diameter or the hydraulic diameter over length times Reynolds times Prandtl over one plus 0 0.016 times hydraulic diameter over length. times Reynolds times Prandtl to the two thirds. And like I said, these are both for laminar systems. Turbulent, we have some other expressions which are pretty sure in the book, but like I said, we're not gonna really get into those in this class. Um, and if the entrance is negligible, We can consider, well, for laminar flow, your Nusselt number is simply 4.36 for case one, where Q is constant, and Nusselt number is equal to 3.66 for case two, where T sub S is constant. And for turbulent flow, our new slot number is given by the Colburn equation, which states that our Nusselt number is approximately 0 0.023 times our Reynolds number to the one third times our Prandtl number, excuse me, Reynolds number's not to the one third. I don't know why I said that. It's 0.8 Prandtl to the N, where N is 0.4 if the fluid's being heated 
n is 0.3 for cooling. And if you're not sure, a value of 0.33 is typically used. And we will use the Colburn equation a lot in the rest of this class. So I definitely would, once again, key equation alert, put that somewhere special in your notes, make a sticker, whatever you do to keep these things identified. And so like I always said, once again, finding those new numbers, it largely depends. You got to figure out lambda or turbulent. In the case of lambda, you got to ask, is entrance length significant? If it is, you got to use a complicated equation. If not, you can approximate the Nusselt number as those single values, 4.36 or 3.66, depending on the expected heat transfer rates and the nature of the convection. And for turbulent flow, as it applies through internal force convection or flow through a tube, it's important because we'll get to a different case for turbulent when we flow around tubes, but for flow through a tube, the Nusselt number is given by the Colburn equation, which states that Nusselt is 0.023 times Reynolds to the 0.8 times Prandtl to the 0.33. That's typically what's used most often. All right. So those are the key principles when it comes to convection. We'll touch base on this stuff again next week, as well as probably work one example to just kind of hammer it before we start jumping into heat exchangers. But I know I kind of threw a lot of stuff at you right there at the end. So do you guys have any questions? Is there anything that you guys would like me to zoom out or go back to so you can see? All of this is available in the lecture slides, so don't feel like you had to copy it down. I know sometimes that's like stressful and nerve wracking because you want to get it in your notes because note taking helps kind of get it in your brain sometimes. Hey, Dr. Lopez, I had a question. Go for it. Um, for the flow through parallel plates equation, is that hydraulic diameter just the space between the two plates? Typically, yes. Okay. Good question, good question. And actually I'll double check that just to be 100% sure. And if it's not, I will send any follow-up email. But yeah, most often it's usually just that distance between the two plates. I always think it's funny, you know, when it's always like flow through parallel plates. And I'm like, well, if the plates aren't parallel, you're, you're, just, you're gonna have a pinch point or it's just gonna, not really be good flow anymore. Seems kind of like a misnomer. That's just me. Any other questions? Uh, I got a few about the test if you're taking, taking questions sure. on this. Uh, so what chapters or, or lectures will it cover? Is it everything up to now? I would probably focus on modules one through five through eight. Okay. Um, I might include a little bit of transient stuff. Um, I'm keen not to, just because I think five through eight has enough material in and of itself. Okay. Granted, I will definitely be pulling from one through four because five through eight builds on it. But you know, you could kind of guess what to see on the exam, right? Probably something about compressible flow probably a packed bed fluidized bed problem there's probably going to be something about basic heat transfer calculations that i want you to do okay. and then as well as doing some interpretations of pump system compressor curve kind of things okay right? you might see something about npsh that kind of stuff right and so i think yes, between those modules that's plenty of material to be tested on okay oh, good question and then, uh Thank you. And then on the the homework assignments, do we need to have all of them, including Tuesdays, submitted before the exam? Well, Tuesdays probably not because it's not going to be. I won't release oh, okay. Tuesday's solution. Um, Perfect. I'll probably release solutions homeworks what five through what, eight. Um, 
most likely on Monday. I'll send an email out this afternoon to be like, hey, if you have a late homework and you're trying to use that pass, submit it by Sunday at midnight or Monday at midnight so I can release keys for people to study with. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Lopez. No problem. I appreciate you answering, getting that feedback. I want to I wanna make sure you guys have everything you need to feel confident because tests are stressful enough and, and I do what I can to make sure that and as much as I can, right? Because there's only a certain point where I'm going to say, well, you know, you just got to do it. It sucks. Like, I get it. I feel you. But I do what I can to help you guys out. I want to see you all succeed. All right. Take care, guys. Have a great weekend. Get some rest. Good luck on that. Uh, what is it? 423 midterm, 421. So good luck. Hopefully you guys knock it out of the park.